I'm, I'm most grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, to my honourable friend for giving way. I've been listening very carefully to what he's got to say, and this is the first occasion I've been involved in this particular bill, but I'm puzzled by it on two counts. First of all, if indeed the honourable gentleman on the opposition front bench is right in saying there's some means of reducing the burden on local authorities, presumably at the expense of businesses, why should that be the case? And also, and forgive me for mentioning this, why should the case that, that should be allowed to occur through this bill here in London? But throughout the rest of the UK, there is no such provision, and the, 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 the legislation which the Honourable General is mentioning perfectly happily covers every other metropolis throughout England. Why should it be that London gets this special treatment? Well, my Honourable Friend is absolutely right, and, and actually gets very neatly to the nub of the issue with this bill and this particular clause. That if this is such a big issue, uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, may even think it's a big issue in his part of the world too. If that is the case, then presumably the problem will apply equally across the whole country. And so if we are going to pass any measures to tackle this particular problem, whether it be a problem or not, the solution for this particular House would be to pass legislation to, so it apply to every single local authority uh, in the country. Uh, what I fail to understand, and perhaps the Honourable Gentleman opposite will try and square this particular circle. If the problem is as he describes it, why would he support this only applying in London, but not applying in any other part of the country, including his own? Perhaps he can explain that. I'll give way to him. Mr. Grove, my for giving way, being very generous indeed, and making a, advancing a persuasive argument until his last uh, argument, Madam Deputy Speaker. It seems to me that where he says this is duplicating existing legislation, that's a perfectly sound argument for not allowing it to be done. But I myself, uh, now that he's talking about theatre tickets and that kind of thing, I myself am a strong supporter of the polluter pays principle. It does seem to me possibly right that actually if the theatre or indeed the burger bar and else is responsible for it, surely there is some argument in favour of saying that they should actually be the people who then pay for clearing up the mess. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with my honourable friend on the first half of his uh, point, and, but disagree with him on the second, because I think if he follows his first uh, half, through to its logical conclusion, he will disagree with himself on the second half because he said that um, he said he believed in the principle of the polluter pays. Now, I think that's a perfectly sound um, basis upon which to start. There may well be some exceptions. I'm sure my old friend for North East Somerset will think of some exceptions where the polluter certainly shouldn't pay. Uh, but I will, I will in a second. I'll just um, finish this point. But in this case, Madam Deputy Speaker, the polluter is not the theatre. Just because the theatre issues a ticket to, to a customer does not mean that when that ticket finds itself on the floor down the street in, in London, it doesn't mean to say that that is the theatre who's the polluter. Surely my honourable friend would accept that the polluter is the individual who dropped the litter, uh, not the, the, the theatre. Uh, and I'm sure my honourable friend, because he's a, he's a very sound man, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm sure he believes as much as I do in individual responsibility. Yeah, yeah, and if he believes yeah. in individual responsibility, he must accept that this is the responsibility of the individual, not the theatre. I'll give way to him again. On reflection, I'm going to now disagree myself and re-disagree with the disagreement that I made against myself a moment ago, if my honourable friend will forgive me for doing so. He's, of course, quite right. Uh, if the person who drops the litter is the person who then pays the fine, as happens under the existing legislation without this clause, then the, the, polluter is indeed, uh, the, the polluter is indeed paying. However, if the institution from which the polluter is emerging pays, that's an entirely different principle under environmental law. Well, I, I, I accept that. If, and, and the point is, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the, surely the problem would be worse because if individuals felt that they weren't going to be held responsibility, responsible for their actions, and yet I will in a second, I do, I, I apologise to the honourable, my honourable friend, uh, that if the individual thought that they were going to be get off scot free and that actually the theatre would take responsibility for this, then we may end up with more litter as a result of this particular problem because individuals will feel free to throw it willy nilly, knowing that they wouldn't be pursued uh, as a. I'm most grateful, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to the honourable gentleman, honourable friend, the member for Shipley, for giving way, He's being very generous, and this speaking with great passion in, from his own libertarian standpoint. But I have to admit that unless uh, I'm getting this wrong, I'm beginning to divert, diverge from his stance. Is he seriously suggesting that, for example, cafes and pubs and other people could have their, their street furniture on the street in our high streets, throw the litter on the ground in the sure and certain knowledge that the local authority, at their own cost, would clear that litter up? Surely there is some polluter pays principle here that actually if a, local, if a cafe were to have a, a chairs on the street, surely it's only reasonable that cafe proprietors themselves, who are making a profit out of the enterprise, should have some responsibility for clearing up the mess. But you see, the, 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 the point is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that my, I think my honourable friend uh, from Brigham Gould addressed this particular issue in his earlier <coughs> intervention, that actually a local authority, the local authority 
uh, that he were, where he was, were actually actively encouraging this kind of activity because it actually helped to keep the streets clean and tidy. And so, at the very best, the very best I can say about this particular clause, which I seek to uh, delete uh, at this point, is that it's a solution looking for a problem. Uh, I think my mother made it particularly clear that there isn't a problem, that actually the solution is to have more of these businesses having street furniture. I'm most grateful to Donald Green Way, and I'm listening carefully to what he has to say. He, he poses an interesting constitutional conundrum, <laughs> namely that because a group of local authorities, he believes, I haven't seen any evidence of this, but he believes a group of local authorities are in favour of something, that therefore somehow or other this House should not have the right to consider that matter. Surely it's unreasonable that we as the sovereign parliament of the United Kingdom should have the right to say whether or not we believe it to be correct and a good thing, even if every local authority affected were to be unanimously in favour of it. Ah, well, of course, and the, the Honourable Gentleman makes a, a perfectly valid constitutional uh, point. Um, but I thought it was his party that were in favour of localism, about greater local determination on the ground. The Honourable Member uh, for ha Harrow East uh, made that very point earlier on in, a, in, a, in, a, in, an, intervention, in an intervention earlier on in the uh, debate. General Darby South, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who's being very generous and is advancing a cogent and interesting uh, argument. But I have two problems. One, he used the expression just now, another tool in the locker with regard to this, these particular uh, clauses. That precisely is one of the arguments that we're advancing against them. There is already a tool in locker, namely the Environmental Protection Act 1980. Why should it be that we require another tool in locker to achieve something that can already be achieved uh, by uh, the existing legislation? And secondly, while I'm on my feet, can you just clarify for us uh, the degree to which these uh, provisions would apply to the parliamentary state and also the government estate down Whitehall. Well, look, I mean, I, I, mean, I think the, I accept that there are other, other provisions available. However, I don't think they uh, necessarily go far enough. I think that they actually leave the local authorities in a difficult position because of the inadequate resources that they have at their disposal. And as I say, I just repeat the point. Having um, uh, other ways in which they can deal with these uh, problems is something which we in this House, I think, ought to... Uh, support. Most great for giving away. This is, this is a thoughtful speech he's making. On this question of public lavatories, I find it difficult to use the word toilet myself. I prefer the word lavatory. As, uh, of course, it's interesting in the bill that the heading is toilet, but the word in the thing is actually lavatory. Quite an interesting point. Does he not agree with me that there's a degree of regressive taxation here? Of course, we all want there to be a ready availability of public lavatories. There's no question about that. Obviously, everyone wants that. The mere question, the question we're discussing here is how you pay for it. On one hand, is it the local authority pays for it as being a, one of their responsibilities under the council tax? Or on the other hand, should it be the users? Now, let's imagine the cost was to be a pound or two pounds or a five pound cost. Surely that's regressive. I don't mind paying that for lovely, splendid, gle gleaming uh, public lavatory. But what about the young family, the poor young family on benefits with five children? What are they going to do? Yes. Well, I, mean, I, I can give uh, the Honourable Gentleman uh, the benefit of some um, anecdotal evidence uh, that, that I've gleaned in, in speaking to. Um, people uh, in relation to the uh, retention of public toilets, young families, elderly people, disabled people, whilst everybody, yes, of course, we'd all love to have access to free uh, facilities, but uh, certainly in the conversations I've had with, with people, if it's a choice between losing the facility altogether or introducing a modest charge, I have to say 100% of the people I spoke to said that they would be prepared to pay a modest charge. Um, and I think... As for there being a prohibitive charge imposed, again, I think we have to trust locally elected representatives to do the right thing. And if local people feel that their local elected councillors have done the wrong thing, then they have the perfect remedy at the ballot box and can vote them out accordingly. Most great, my honourable friend. I've been listening very carefully to what she has to say, and also her honourable friend before her, and this question of the principle the polluter pays. And, of course, uh, she's quite right in saying that if it's a casual cigarette thrown down by a passerby, then quite plainly it's impossible for that particular polluter to be charged. But, nonetheless, would there not be of some merit in the principle of the vicarious polluter pays? In other words, if a business, for example, has a cafe on the, on the pavement, uh, or if it's uh, McDonald's has a uh, cheap uh, food and takeaway outlet uh, in the area, even though it may not be McDonald's themselves who drop the piece of litter on the pavement, it's reasonable presumption they have made a profit out of providing the hamburger to the person who then does drop it, and therefore vicariously, not unreasonable, they should be asked to pay for clearing it up. 
Well, I, I never thought I'd, I'd be speaking up. My offer makes a very practical point. I never thought I'd be speaking up to defend McDonald's. But I have to say, that is exactly what happens in St Albans. McDonald's and Sainsbury's with their carrier bags or any other big company does have a recognition and works with the local council and does help um, towards paying up, it, recognising that if a Sainsbury's carrier bag has drifted up against a fence 100 yards away from the supermarket, they still help with the local authority in terms of clearing these things up and are willing to work. It's the poor small businesses that can't carry the can on this one. We're talking about the huge businesses such as McDonald's and people will say, oh, well, that's their packet thrown away 100 yards or so away from the, from the uh, shop that's selling them. And there is a recognition of this and often they will help with, um, with local authorities to clear up and contribute towards uh, schemes that, that do that. But what I'm saying is, is this will often penalise small businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about them? How, how, if we're going to have, as my honourable friend proposes, some sort of separate legislation for branded litter, that might be easier to enforce. But this isn't what this is about, unless we're going to go chasing Marlborough Light somewhere and ask for them to pay for that as well. This should be the fact that the person has dropped the litter. They are ultimately responsible. And if that means better surveillance by the council, if that means a recognition that they just have to clean those areas more, then so be it. I don't think the small business should have to pick up the tab. And, of course, I'll give way to my own. I'm most grateful to the Honourable Lady for St Albans, Mr Deputy Speaker, for giving away generously again. I slightly used a bad example in my earlier intervention, I think, by using a big business talking about McDonald's. The point I was making was about the vicarious polluter pays. Let's imagine it's a small business. A cafe is set up on the streets of St Albans, and around that cafe there's an increase in litter appearing around the tables. There's a reasonable presumption, surely, that it's the customers of that cafe who produce that uh, litter, and therefore surely there's a reasonable presumption that written into the cost of, of, of creating the cup of tea and the sticky bun, that the cafe would write in the uh, 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 cost to cover the clearing up of that litter. My honourable friend makes a valuable point, but as I think has been raised before in this debate, I am not aware of any premise that would want to be serving their customers in a pigsty. I think the reality is, is that most cafes and small businesses take a great pride in what happens outside their premises. This is to deal with what I believe has been raised as part of this. This is to deal with litter being dropped, particularly cigarette butts. This isn't to deal with the bit of tomato on the floor that's come out of your BLT from your local uh, shop.